Agreed. Agreed. You didn't get the exponential growth until though, until until a web browser. Now this, this is typically, I guess, the the launching of the web. Yeah, the internet was doing well, but it, it went to hundreds of millions of people, largely because of the web, not just email. But re yeah. regardless, we, regardless, mm -hmm. we need in this space, we need a user interface moment. Um, yes. My fear is we're actually pretty far from it. Yeah, we could be. We could be. Uh, there are so many problems. So. Anyway, uh, I think we can start. Um, and before we go, we have to talk about two things. One is the antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation, which obviously means that we are not engaged in any collusive activities. The second is that we, there is a code of conduct, which means that even when we uh, disagree with people, we are not disagreeable. Those are the only two rules. And if you don't agree with these, you can probably leave the call. <laughs> that, that's, that's what I'm supposed to say. Uh, anyway, Daryl O'Donnell, the man, <laughs> Jim Sinclair says he agrees to be disagreeable. Well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it's more in the line of a joke than anything else. Um, Daryl O'Donnell, what can I say? He's uh, well known for uh, being in the forefront of the SSI movement being an early investor in many enterprises that you're familiar with, and also a technologist, uh, written a, you know that seminal paper on digital wallets after having engaged with the community for a long time, uh, and now part of the chapters in the SSI book by Drummond is by Darrell, and it is my hope that we can. Uh, march down the chapters uh, or sections, I should say, and have the people present on the different sections. So hopefully that's what we're gonna do in the next uh, few sessions. Uh, without saying anything more, I think uh, Daryl is going to take it away and... Perfect. I'm gonna... And I'll share my screen. Let me know when you're when you're ready for me to take over there, Vipin. Yeah, just want to say that we are recording the session, so uh, you know, don't be disagreeable. That's it. You're you're on, Daryl. Perfect. I'm just uh, I've got some crazy Zoom action going on. Let me know. Are you seeing uh, open system preferences? I have a new uh, new laptop. Give me one second. It's not allowed to see the screen. That's why. And I'm praying it doesn't say, okay, I'll be right back into Zoom. I just need to quit and reopen Zoom, not reboot. Be right back. Okay, while uh, Daryl is uh, taking a short uh, break because of Zoom issues, which we all understand, um, I just didn't want Oh, here he's back. He's back. These these new uh, Apple M1 uh, computers are uh, are pretty impressive. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, perfect. So I've got the. This is a deck that I think some of us have already seen on this particular uh, venue. What I've gone through is because, and I want to say, uh, Mike Brown indicates I'm the OG of wallets. Uh, Mike is one of the supporters of the project. Uh, He's actually, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll save a little tidbit for a little bit later of you know why we created this uh, this research project that turned into a monster and, and thus the paper. Um, but this this presentation actually Vipin is very very much based on one I think I gave similarly uh, last January, so just a little over a year ago. Um, what's interesting is that the digital wallet report itself. Let me just. Uh... It was actually <clears throat> December eleventh, twenty nineteen. 2019. So that was about uh, nine months after we released the report. 
And so it's now been another 13, 14 months. Um, what's interesting is, is to me at least, the bigger picture, the broad strokes of the wallets haven't changed that much. What's really happened is, is updates and learnings and some surprises um, that, that I've found along the way. But quickly, you know, I'm going to go through why we did a study, talk a little bit about the capabilities, and this deck will be available, obviously, recording of the meeting. Talk a bit about the state of where tech is, the business and markets, and then a couple of these updates throughout the deck, you'll see the, this uh, particular color font. I've actually got, I've modified the slides to raise some attention to things that either have changed, been learned, been updated, um, been understood more. So I'll just get right into it. So first off, why a study? This is where uh, uh, Mike Brown uh, uh, is one of the people who we were, uh, well, first off, I don't do reports. I can't believe how many, I can't believe I wrote and, and you're, it's, I'm flattered you call it the seminal report. It's strange for me to have anyone say that. And you're not the only one. It's kind of weird because I really don't do reports. I typically get involved in projects that are executing on a mission critical basis um, or are potentially in trouble and struggling. Um, and I really can't tell you how much I hate reports. And Mike can tell you how whiny I was about doing it. So why did we do it? And this comes into uh, Mike and I at one point, we were down in IIW. And I was just getting annoyed. I got angry. That's why I wrote the report. That's why we committed to a bunch of us in Canada uh, committed to throwing resources at this and doing the research and writing the report. Because at that point in time, that would have been fall 2018, I guess. Every answer to every question, every problem, well, how will you do that? Oh, the world of wallet handles that. It was just simply hand waving. And as a, as a system of systems type of engineer, I, I couldn't handle it. So this lack of clarity in the digital wallet, what is a wallet, what does it do, what does it not do, was really impacting things. And Vipin, just a quick sound check. Are you guys hearing me okay? We are hearing you loud and clear. Good, because I'm actually in a factory that's uh, producing some uh, surgical masks in front of me and it's actually quite loud. I'm really impressed with the audio of, uh, of, of Apple and stuff. So what, what Mike and I were talking with some other leaders in the space is that the lack of clarity was creating problems at all levels. Um, very, very smallest of startups. Mike is with a uh, relatively large bank in Canada. Um, everybody was getting this, 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 oh, the wallet, this nefarious wallet thing is going to solve it. So really to, for us as an, en as an engineer, Mike is both uh, technical and business oriented. And everyone else we were talking to is kind of... Uh, you couldn't really point your finger at all the problems we need to solve. So we dove, we dove in and just wanted to know where to start. What's that bare minimum of, of what, what do we need to know about wallets and where does this go? So what did we do? We did a bunch of research, the classic uh, IIW, Internet Identity Workshop, Reboarding Web of Trust, got involved with a bunch of different leaders around the globe and wrote two reports. And I can't tell you again how much I hate writing reports. The public one, which is what I'm dealing with mostly here, is Creative Commons. It's intended to be used broadly by anybody. Um, you know, it would be good to have attribution, but hey. The other side was a private report, which was aimed at the, the, the main sponsors of the project, which was, okay, cool, here's the big picture. Now, given your particular business context, here's what makes more sense. I'll be talking about the public side, and really you can just imagine any business is gonna have a different flavor of different pieces. So if we look at the wallet capabilities, I'm not going to deal with these too much because they kind of rip through and we've all seen a bunch of these. Um, I will point out a few things that people that are one really concerning. Backup and recovery is one that was concerning back then, remains concerning. Um, the concept of vault was what we the term we were using to over two years ago, um, which now if you want to deal with uh, Tim Berners-Lee, um, the, the pod concept, uh, Diff uses the term hub. Um, how do you support multiple devices? These terms have really kind of evolved. The term, there was no answer for where do I put my stuff that's in the cloud and keep it safe for me. So we called it a vault. And that term has really kind of evolved into multiple spaces. Um, Hub itself has, has spawned into multiple places in multiple different distinct capabilities at Diff. And then we got into guardianship delegation, which still remains um, a bugaboo. All of these different things, all of these capabilities were dug, dealt with in the report. Um, it's one of these reports that uh, another one of the uh, uh, one of the, one of the, the team members of the projects asked uh, 
He said, uh, can I just get a summary? Because it's about 90 pages. Um, I said, yeah, but that's double. Um, because hard, summarizing and removing content was really, really hard. But the goal here and what we found and Drummond and I went through and, and it unfortunately, and fortunately, the, the wallet report has turned into content in the SSI book that's out coming, that's coming, I think, in the next month. Um, it is a little skinnier, but we actually focus really on digital wallet and agents because we kind of separated the terminology a bit. But behind the, behind the digital wallets themselves, this is where one of the changes is, we wanted to make sure that things were understood to be you know, consent driven, uh, largely speaking, um, in most of the societies that are, we're dealing with, we need to want to make sure we're supporting consent. There are different jurisdictions that, you know, it'll be, you know, it's, it, it's my way or the highway and there really won't be any consent. But the goal being that any of this is run by consent is privacy by design, uh, security by design and portable and open by default. And there's a new one, um, which is kind of a refinement of privacy by design. I wanted to bring this up. This is just a recent clarification from, uh, it, it's come out of a bunch of players again in Canada, uh, more on the government side. And John Jordan uh, recently at one of the Trust Over IP Foundation meetings kind of just casually threw out a few requirements that, that um, I actually, I don't normally watch recordings, uh, especially if I've been in the meeting. Um, I went and went through the recording multiple times to capture the following, which is this, again, this is new content. Um, I'm gonna talk about the two concepts here in the center here. First off, um, that these wallets, the requirements when we talk about proof requests and credentials, how do we use them? They must support requesting proofs from parts of one or more credentials. This is a guiding requirement in order for, you know, larger scale adoption to happen. Single use case, you don't need this. But if you take a look at things like Good Health Pass right now, you're talking about a vaccine certification that's tied to a passport, that's linked up to a, uh, a, an airplane ticket, and has rules that crosses all three of those other credentials that need to be processed in order for you to walk into another country at the border. By definition, you are ideally selecting doing selective disclosure on multiple credentials, or you're at least granting access to full multiple credentials. But what this really falls down to is that only one service, this is down the road. We knew in the wall report referred to the, in the long term, this really is an operating system play on the smartphone. It's gonna be an Apple. It's gonna be a Samsung and Samsung and I'll separate and say Android because they do kind of do their own thing in the wallet space but really it means only one service on the phone can, re can respond to such a request. You can't have a, reuse, a, a realistic use case where I walk up to a customs officer um, as I enter a country and say, oh, excuse me, I'll just, yeah, just keep hitting me and I'll, I'll respond you through these various different apps. You can do it, it won't fly, literally. Um, that's a terrible pun. Um, but so that's one of those conditions. The other one gets into real confidentiality um, which is the connections that are formed. These are those pairwise connections we have, whether that's between the issuer of the holder, the holder and verifier, uh, just people, must be confidential. And the analogy John uses is really good. And he said, it's like the fact you don't know that I went to the doctor unless I tell you. Or perhaps there's a third party needed and we agree that that third party is needed. In the banking space, if I move more than a certain amount of money, you're, there is a, a, a highly recommended uh, uh, at least one third party to be involved. Otherwise, you are very, very likely going to fall into the grounds of, of money laundering or suspe uh, suspicious activity reporting. Um, and it just doesn't make for a good day if you do that. But the requirement being that, that there's no third party has awareness of that connection. You don't know I went to the doctor unless we agree. And agree can mean that there are external requirements that force that upon us but it's not a baseline capability of the technology to require third party. Similarly, that the contents of those communications are not disclosed, again, unless the parties agree. So you don't know what I talked to the doctor about. You don't know what my financial transaction was about, again, unless we want third parties involved in that. This is one of the, uh, the biggest sort of aha moments in the wallet space that I've had in the last certainly year. Um, and I wanted to share that one in particular. So when we talk about wallets, you know, what kind of stuff is in wallets? We, we've, we've talked many times that anybody who's been at IIW or any of the identity when you're getting into digital wallets, there's a lot of stuff you put in, in your wallet. 
um, whether that's uh, you know receipts you may buy you can imagine in the future buying a TV at Best Buy and uh, your Sony TV warranty is automatically assigned, throwing your wallet beside the receipt. What Sony would love about that is now maybe they have a direct connection with you as a customer. Best Buy may not like that, but they may have to do it. Um, all of these different things. We talk about address books, relationships, um, consent. But how do I you know, mark that I have consented to something? How do I revoke that? Um, all these various different things that we put in the wallet, it gets pretty complicated pretty darn quickly. We also in the report talked a little bit about the enterprise. What's unique there about the enterprise, one of which is scale. Um, large companies tend to deal with thousands or tens, hundreds, millions of connections, millions of things that they want to track, billions of things they want to track. Um, as well as you have multiple agents, both on the agent as a software paradigm, you may have an HR department where has one part of the business that they're handling. You have a purchasing department, an accounts receivable, you have messaging, you have legal sign off. All of these different agents are acting on software basis, but you also have multiple people, which is where you now have to get into delegation. Um, it, it's kind of, it's humorous to think about now. I mean, I, um, about companies still using, they still do this. We talked to um, uh, at, at multiples of the, 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 I would say the dinner slash beer discussions while doing the report research that, you know, big corporations, uh, one of the biggest things they have in their, the most protected things they have in their vault is a corporate stamp, um, which is kind of humorous because as a technology, it's pretty outdated, but it's something that needs to be protected because only the people can access those very particular um, roles, responsibilities and actions that they can take really need that delegation. What rights do I have as president and CEO of my company? What rights and, 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 and responsibilities do I have as an employee somewhere or as a member of an association? All of this delegation becomes much, much more important on an enterprise basis because when you look at it, I as an individual can sign for something. A corporation cannot. By definition, that role of signing is delegated to a human right now. In the future, perhaps it'll be an AI, but there's a separate entity who is actually doing the work on behalf of the enterprise, and that becomes very important quickly. As well as the protection required at an enterprise level. Um, losing your personal keys is a tragic thing. Losing your keys for a full corporation can impact lives of thousands or millions of people, potentially, um, as we know with breaches. Um, but even if I, I, I was just reading about a, a, on Reddit a couple of weeks ago, a company had their whole ERP, um, their customer management, their CMS, um, had a custom domain name service, DNS resolution tooling inside of it, and it crashed and they lost it. They lost their complete ERP and CMS. They believe the company may die. And this is thousands of people who are employed there. You need to protect these things. They need to be backed up. They need to make sure that you know, backup is not an attack vector, that type of thing. Um, another thing, one thing we didn't cover was um, the initial thinking was this, and this has happened multiple times in multiple different vendors in not just the sovereign H Hyperledger Airy space, but other places that I've talked to where people were adamant that, um, you know, if you, 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 no keys, no coins, that an enterprise must and wants to support the part, hold the private key and do all of the signing actions for their did when they're doing any decentralized identity stuff. We have found multiple people have gone and spent the money to do that so that there's kind of this signing virtual machine that you as a customer have to take care of and feed. Um, and it will do all the signing such that your, your partner, your software as a service partner, doesn't know your keys. I have yet to find any enterprise barring, and actually, Jim, you're on the phone. There are healthcare enterprises who don't want that but I'm still betting there is a third party who actually has that service level agreement and a contract to manage those keys because the customers don't want the complexity. They understand they've already been doing key management in various different aspects. They understand the ramifications of screwing it up, of losing it, of being compromised. What they want is a partner, typically a top tier uh, uh, consultancy type of partner. So they have a throat to choke when something goes wrong. So what's interesting is people have spent the engineering dollars on keeping that wallet completely separate, having the signing capability. When it turns out, it's not a, I, I've asked people, how many have you sold? The answer has been zero. 
to date that I've heard. We got into um, wallets and agents. This is another area where the, the, the SSA, and it's funny because I, I went through the report and I forgot to go through the book, but the book actually kind of really brought the agents and wallets into what I would call a kind of a peer, a top level relationship. So it's the agents are just as, and I think actually in time, they become even more important. I want wallets to get really boring, unsexy. Um, when we talk about different types of agents, you can see on the right side here, ranging from messaging to privacy to, you know, home delivery, your health agent, reputation management, all of these different agents are going to be there. But one of the key things we also brought up was, you know, the term that I've used in blog posts and, and in, in tweets and stuff is, who is in your wallet? Because there's this, this anathema, you know, it's my keys, it's my wallet, I don't want anyone in there. And I, that's great, love it, take care of your life that way. But right now, I don't have the time or the, or the inkling to go and manage my own health records when I can have somebody do that. I uh, have digital assets, things I want to protect and make sure that they're backed up. I would love to be able to tap a bank or a credit union for that type of thing because they have the right infrastructure. So how do they join into the wallet? But additionally, what about things like a break glass capability? For, care, for clar clarity, this is the break glass in case of emergency. Um, there's a lot of uh, electronic health record solutions that um, if somebody is not able to respond, either they don't have the mental capacity, they're unconscious, um, there is sort of a bare minimum set of records that are typically available to someone when and if things have gone horribly wrong and you can't answer the question, do you mind if we look at your files, sir or ma'am? That capability is pretty key and really does start to become and require a third party to say, yes, we're in that break class scenario. Um, there are also insurance people who may be involved in monitoring some of my assets. People who just monitor things in general. We may have auditors, especially when you get into a corporate capability. If I have a digital signing capability that is completely unmonitored, I've got a serious compliance problem. Um, I need to have logging of that. So there's a requirement to be able to, not, 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 not make it mandatory, but be able to bring these people into your wallet, these different services, so that you can either farm it out to somebody, you wanna be able to reclaim it, obviously, but to actually bring those folks in. To me, the, the message I've had over the past year and a half, uh, two years since the report came out, is that agents are becoming more and more important. Um, right now, we're still at the very most basic of agents. If you take a look in the Hyperledger space itself, there's uh, recently a couple groups released, uh, you know, a new version of a mediator agent. That's a really basic agent, you know, basically answer the question, where's my phone? Send this to it. Um, as opposed to, you know, doing anything real um, intensive of, of acting on my behalf, merging things, that type of thing. So talk a little bit about the state of the tech, of the tech, the art of the possible, and talk about um, successes. And in, in the old report, I really had, very few outside of the lab. There really were two years ago, none. Now we're seeing real solutions. One that I was involved with um, was uh, CEO Ledger's member pass, which was launched a um, little bit after, after the report was, uh, but really went live. I guess it, was, it, was, it went live really in early 2020. Um, now they've got, uh, I think they're approaching 100,000 live connections to real uh, credit union members. And they have uh, something like, 3 million prospects and the, and the feedback thus far has been fantastic, but it is the most basic of uses. We're seeing more and more of those. Um, we're seeing again, the agents, the Hyperledger Aries is really one of the state of the tech yard of the possible that has really kind of come into its own over the past little while. Um, it has become uh, helpful for many different groups to, to hit it in very different forms. We've even seen um, some Hyperledger Aries work that's not anchoring down to Indy, it's anchoring down to different networks, which is an awesome interoperability thing. But also where are things working and failing right now? Um, right now, the single purpose use cases are really the only cases I'm seeing in the wild of digital wallets. When I say single purpose use case, if I take a look at, uh, as it, just as an example, one of my clients at CU Ledger with the member pass, it was basically member pass is a cloned, that's a copy of Evernim's Connect Me with a bunch of features removed. You can't uh, browse credentials. You can't browse connections unless you have more than one credential and more than one connection, which I believe would probably be measured somewhere on the order of 0.001%, if not lower, of the member pass users. 
They don't need it. They don't want it. They don't want to know about the complexity of what's a connection. They don't want to know what's a complexity, what's a credential, because right now there's not enough value for them. So the biggest thing was that that's even stronger than I thought it would be. I've also got cases, what I would call hidden wallets. So member pass is kind of one of them. We do speak to it. The credit unions speak to it with members, but they don't know that it's using this thing called self-sovereign identity. That SSI term has not been raised in the credit union space in some time. It adds absolutely no value to the casual user to understand that, oh, it's a digital wallet with self-sovereign identity. You control the, you know, they, they get that from the user experience. They don't need or care, which is kind of cool because we don't need to justify things anymore. That baseline we're using, it's just there. Um, where is it really hard? To me, this is the learning has been that the user experience is brutal, um, which is why if you take a look at member pass, it is a dumbed down, dead, simple, almost trivialized as an engineer developer, reform developer, it's trivialized version of connect me, but it's meeting the need. What's really hard? backup and recovery um, to the point that we say, okay, one of the features to turn off on the member pass side was turn off backup. Backup, depending on how you do it, is an attack vector. One of the sad things we'd learned about the, the society at large that we're kind of sheltered in the tech space because we're probably you know a little bit above certainly likely middle class and don't see as much of the desperate crime. One of the number one attack vectors in the credit union banking space is family fraud um, where and here's the attack vector. If I go and fall asleep, you can grab my phone. This is back or, or use my thumb, whatever. Use my phone to copy the backup, restore it to your phone. And I have no idea that that's been done, but I'm no longer receiving messages, but you are. You've now taken over my account. And that is a major attack vector and always has been, is family members taking over accounts. And then you get strangers and stuff, but the number of family members who do it is amazing. Another hard thing is migration. Because this technology is so early stage, decisions have been made that at times have painted us into corners. So lifting from a version to another version, when you take a look at, and this is, there's discussion in the, and I'll get interoperability in a bit, there's discussion in space over who's interoperable, who's not. Well, the reality is no one is. If you think you are, you don't know what interoperability is in the big picture, but even people among their own technology stack can't migrate from version to version without some pretty serious stuff. So that's something that people are learning right now. I believe largely overcoming, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a learning in the space that was like, oh yeah, that was a pretty short-sighted decision we made. How do we, un, how do we back it up and then move away from it? Interop, as I mentioned, is a little hard. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, as far as where the R&D is required, all of these pieces still um, really do warrant R&D whether it be you know, capital R academic research or little d versus full commercial development, all of these are sitting in various different places. Let's talk a little bit about standards. This is one that uh, I meant to, I'm gonna cover in a second in more detail. It was one of the, one of the surprises that I guess, I, and I realized when I reread it, I, I wasn't strong enough on my statements. I'm actually gonna post a new blog article on what I've been saying as opposed to what I've written on protocol evolution and where the standards are really, where we really are as a space. Um, the standards on, on, on assurance levels was key to understand. Uh, the Pan Canadian Trust Framework has really, really, that's a big change. I should have marked that in one in red. It has done a couple of things. One at the national standard level, what's called the CIO Strategy Council. Um, I'm one of the vice chairs of one of, the, one of their streams, um, has passed a, a very solid governance trust framework guidance um, based on, it was anchored on the public sector version of the pan Canadian Trust Framework. That was a key win for the industry because it's some of the best terminology we've seen. It's actually quite compatible with trust over IP. Uh, portability standards as far as trust over IP was really another learning. It only launched last May. It's got, uh, I think there's a couple hundred members now, different organizations, as, I mean, many hundreds of people. Um, and the big warning I would say comes back to standardization and interoperability. Um, and, and the term I'm using, and this again, I'm going to start posting about this, is what I call premature standardization or premature interoperability. I think we're kidding ourselves on, on where we actually are today and how hard it's going to be and what we're looking at. I'm going to skip past user experience um, and jump into the past the business. I, I know for the time I want to get to this point here, which relates to both the standards and where we really are as an industry. And the message I'm giving to people is anyone who thinks that we're at a utility level, 
equivalent to um, you know, S3 storage at, uh, at Amazon or your electricity um, provider is smoking something, um, they're deluded and they're wrong about, and they're gonna be making really, really bad decisions on a business basis because they don't understand the industry and where it is. If anybody's following, and I'll share the, uh, uh, the, the, a link to this deck, um, but this is uh, Simon Wardley, Wardley Maps is a concept. I tweeted out in uh, just about a, well, earlier this month where we really are. Now, stage one is called Genesis. It's the unknown. It's the, hey, didn't see that coming, which I remember when I first talked to Mike Brown about SSI, when we, he and I had both, I guess, the prior year prior had realized it's changing how things are done. It came out of nowhere. No one has a clue. And let's be clear, we still don't. The concept of Genesis and unknown means it's truly bleeding edge. And custom means there is no standard. There's no... Uh, obvious winner in the market. And this is what he, uh, Simon Wardley's done a great job of, of delineating this. And I went through in each of his characteristics of where we are. There isn't a single one where we're solidly in two, meaning it's custom, which is still custom is a, uh, a very exciting startup phase of an industry, but it is not like Salesforce is full utility now. Um, 10 years ago, it was still product. The whole CRM space was product. And before that, it was just a bunch of databases we'd all written. But this is where the thinking is. If you think you're in um, a product or utility phase, which is really the thing, the strategies you're using are wrong. If you recognize where you really are, if you're going to go from A to B, it's really important to know where B is. It is far more important to know where A is. So don't kid yourself about where we are is my biggest message. And I've probably been harping on that for the last, well, probably since the report hit the ground. And just speaking quickly to what I call premature standardization and interoperability. Um, there's my view of the world is that when we're looking at this kind of a technology, we're really looking at isolated proprietary protocols. Trust over IP is working to create what I would call a community protocol. Um, there are very certain decisions being made. There are certain design, uh, dominant design patterns emerging but we still haven't gone all the way to the various different, there are multiple standards, specifications that need to be created that go into the full formal, whether trust over IP, which is an SDO and can produce it, or we push some per certain parts over to IETF, OASIS, W3C, et cetera. These things are sitting here at this isolated and community level, not where people think they are. And the amount of work to get there is heavy. It also, is driven by more and more adoption, um, which means it gets slower because you can't change everybody all at once. But I think we're a lot, people are not understanding how far and hard this is. Um, I was involved in the breaking of the back of what I would call proprietary uh, geospatial, proprietary GIS back in the 90s. Um, and it was a Herculean effort. The results though were, I know on the defense space, uh, the defense and intelligence space, especially the classified world, saw cost savings of 10X. What was costing them a million dollars suddenly cost less than $100,000 in that kind of a ratio for data, for imagery, um, because we ended up creating uh, what it was called, you know, specifications and interoperability test suites, which has already started at Trust Over IP uh, and the Hyperledger Aries project. They're kind of merging together to create the interoperability test suite because what the interoperability test suite did in the mapping age and if anybody knows and watches on a slow connection, when you're on Google Maps and you see these tiles come in, even prior to that, there was a standard that was driven called the web mapping standard that once the specification got to a certain point and interoperability testing got to a certain point, the industry stopped whining, stopped pointing at each other, stopped blaming each other. And as I mentioned, the costs of data fell by 10X, 90% reduction in cost. That's when you change the game. It's also when you know I'm no longer on the bleeding edge of things as a company, not knowing what surprise I'm going to hit. There's an, there's an answer to exactly what does good enough look like. So that's a lot of work we still have to do ahead of us. Then the Trust Over IP Foundation, I raised that here because it's, it's new. We launched in May. Um, it, it came out of a bunch of the work in various different spaces, including deeply in Sovereign, that that we knew that there needed to be somebody focused on the bigger picture. Um, that governance and tech stack, this dual tech stack, and I'll show that in a moment, 
that was created really allows us to, um, we've had very, very, it's amazing to see the work at Decentralized Identity Foundation, DIFF, for example. There was a lot of pushback on the four layer model because it's, but then as we, as we, as we work together, started to break things down on a technical basis, we realized this thing actually is falling into place quite nicely. They've got a beautiful architecture saying, here are the different layers, here's the interface between layers, here's the various different standards or code bases that are out there and how architecture fits together. Um, just a, I, the Good Health Pass Collaborative. Um, I'm, uh, I'm co-chair of one of the, uh, the trust registries group. Um, it's hosted at the Trust YP Foundation. This is pretty much where a lot of the governance and the big picture tech stack work has really moved over. Um, Hyperledger Aries, as an example in, the, in this particular group, um, the business side of it, the governance side of it's there over at Trust for IP. And Hyperledger Aries is really where the code, uh, the, the, the test suite sitting there. But the idea as you go through Trust for IP, and again, this is probably the biggest change um, to the wallet, the agent space is this consistent terminology that we can use. What is and where does an agent fit? Where does a trust registry fit? Whose role, who's a governance authority at, at which particular layer? This started to really clear up a lot of the questions that were out there. That's it for me, folks. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer or any, any input. Don't feel shy. Oh, Sean has got his hand up already. Daryl, great deck. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I've been out of the game for about, well, rooting from the stands, but out of the game for about almost two years now. When you go back to that slide that you and John Jordan worked on, um, I think it was the second or third one in the deck. I just have a real quick question. So I, I see it as uh, it's with a split. Perfect. I see it as sort of the analog to, to warm introductions, right? Like I know Vipin and I know Daryl and Daryl wants to meet Vipin. I just don't connect you two. I say, hey, Vipin, I know this guy, Daryl. He wants to meet up. Here's the reason why I, I don't do that just in general in the real world. Does this open up though, you know, in this idea that um, connections should be aware of the connection, the parties need to agree. Does this open up an opportunity for verifiable credentials where I am, a, 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 a bank would be willing to use, a bank would be willing to give me a credential for proof of address, but only for renting a house, not for being used right. with another bank yep. or my airline would give me a credential for the number of frequent flyer miles, but the rule set behind it, the terms and conditions they'd be willing to apply would include, you can use these, you can share these miles with anybody, but another airline. Um, it, it, is there sort of an overlay of rules of use or terms of use that you're seeing there? Oh yeah, totally, totally. This comes down to really the bottom level of that, of that uh, both the, the credentialing and the connection is don't force the third party. So let's take your example. You introduce Vipin and I, um, you do a double opt-in, which is the best approach, right? Right. Op, uh, Vipin or myself responds to the message, puts you on BCC. That lets you know that we're gonna talk. Cool, we got connected. We may just talk to each other and you may have no knowledge of that. That would be kind of weird, but it's not required for me to tell you. If you build into the bottom level architecture that it's required, for that third party, you open up a can of worms. If you allow for a third party, and I love the idea of, you know, that that's, and, and Mike would tell you it's the telco that does the address, but they might be willing for a good customer to do a rental credential that has very specific rules that say for the purposes of rental, yes. For the purposes of moving money, no. <laughs> right, like what's their risk yep. tolerance, which they would allow 100%. Yep. Exactly, and that would require um, more. That would require more than potentially, you know, uh, multiple credentials and or multiple connections, but at the base level, you're not enforcing a third party in the play. That's all. So not awesome. it's not excluding the third party. It's saying you're welcome if you're welcome. You're not required though. No, thank thank you for that. And the the only other question I have is around this. I uh, you mentioned agents later on the deck. Is there a possibility based on a relationship that I create that I'd be forced to use an agent like an audit, an agent for auditing, for example. Oh, I could see, I could see. Uh, actually, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. uh, Mike, I, I believe I can speak to this, or generically speaking, uh, there are banks that have uh, that will bank companies that are mining crypto. 
with a caveat that says, you will tell us your wallet address and we are applying a service to monitor that address because we want to tell you if and when you're getting dirty coin. So you, like you can, anything else, there's always- choose to enter into that relationship or not, got it. Exactly. If you, yeah, now one would say, if there's only one bank in the country, well, it's kind of coercive. That said, you don't have to do it. There's no one with a gun to your head. I would say there will be regimes there where there is no option. You will use this wallet and it has these agents you likely don't even know. But if you look at the data moving around, you can probably figure, oh, okay, the state has an agent in there. That's my life, but I'm not, that's, that's a different world than, we're, than what we're talking about here, I think. And also you end up, you know, you, you, on this slide, you say no third party has awareness of a connection unless the parties agree. One of the initial sort of big benefits of self-sovereign identity as a concept was uh, correlation resistant, but not unless I put them together. Right. Like if I'm going to make a compound proof for getting a new apartment, which includes data from my bank, my last uh, my, my last landlord and my electric company. If they make it a requirement that they know the other connections in the proof, they're going to that would kind of break or at least it's differential sort of. Correlation. Yeah. And, yeah. And this gets into some of the work we're actually doing at the Good Health Pass, where you can Fine imagine enough. a situation where someone says, uh, I need to know it was signed by your bank and I need to know which bank it is. Over time, I think there'll be a list of bona fide banks. I know where the list of bona fide credit unions is in the US. It's at member pass. So you may just say it is a federally or a certified bank, certified your address, good to go. I don't need anything more than that. I don't need to know you're dealing with Chase or UBS or whatever. Gotcha. Thank you. Great stuff. Good to hear your voice, dude. Anyone else? Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are others with burning questions. Otherwise, I'll ask a couple. I think uh, Vip and uh, Luke has a, has a question with a UI for this uh, to work like with sign in with Indy or Aries. Um, there certainly are, Luke, different user experiences. A lot of them right now um, are more along the lines. And this is something that is not done in Member Pass right now, but we've been working with. Um, well, they've been working. I, I, I was CTO there for some uh, contract CTO for a while. Um, I'm now an advisor. We were working with the use case where you go to log in and your phone would say, just like if you're using Microsoft Authenticator now, it would say, hey, Daryl, are you logging in Unify Financial Credit Union? Yes or no? Yes. Boom. Passwordless login. Um, the same login with Indeed, login with Member Pass. Absolutely, people are looking at those. Um, I think the hope that certainly I've got is that I never see another login button. It just, just works and it's secure and it's mine. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I have a couple, uh, you know, let's say observations. First thing is last time we presented, we were very much on the, uh, wallets for credentials related to identity. Now the wallets use case, as you know, has exploded uh, in, the, in the crypto space and elsewhere. I mean, it is the UX uh, that, that is needed. And you mentioned a couple like, for example, the healthcare, uh, but what about the other other use cases? Like, you know, uh, you sort of started talking about them a little bit, but as a self-hosted wallet or something controlling uh, value somewhere, um, you know, uh, what what are your thoughts on that? When you like, say controlling value. Like a typical uh, crypto wallet, let's say. Okay. That I'm, I can move stuff, I can do stuff, you know, uh, and we are not talking about, you know, the other controls, the, the supervisory controls uh, that yeah. are required by, let's say, OCC or uh, right. FATF or some, some other body, but. 
so yeah i mean the, the initial focus again yeah was, was definitely on on quote identity you know self-sovereign identity to me the 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 key really is and i think uh, uh dave hughes is using the term authentic data john jordan and i were talking about uh, it's verifiable data where the difference now with this system is um one of the guys i'm working with he says you know i'm my own endpoint meaning i i'm my own api i carry my data you don't need to go and integrate an api you just need to know can you trust my data and you trust my data by looking at the data has it been tampered with and do i know and understand who the issuer was the ability to carry this data is huge and it's actually to me bigger than the identity side of it the the ability to have verifiable information to be exchanged is far more powerful when you get into the 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 linkages into the the crypto and crypto wallet space there's a largely speaking they're quite similar but if you take a look at the three different kinds of of crypto there's there's the the real you know the fungible token style where it's a value it's a bitcoin ethereum um you know i, I you and i exchange a bitcoin i don't care it's a different address but it, it's still a you know just like a dollar is a dollar then you have the non-fungible tokens which somebody just actually joked on the internet yesterday that they're going to sell their vaccination credential vaccination certificate as an nft um which is i think brilliant because you look at an nft well i'm really hoping you're not getting a vaccination credential as an nft Although if I'm going for a flight VIP and I might want to borrow yours and I'll pay you to borrow your vaccination credential. Some of these things are going to be transferable. Some of them are not. One of the learnings on the wallet side in the banking space and other spaces, healthcare too. Um, I may decide I want, don't trust the wallet app you're using. So I'm not going to let you do anything. And I may not allow you to transfer your data without my knowledge and or approval. That might be for protection of you as an individual that might be for protection of the enterprise itself. Because I don't want you to suddenly, and the joke I use in the, in the report is, you know, can I trust Bubba's wallet? You know, it's got the best user experience, everything's transferable and turns out it's written by North Korea. We have to be careful of those kind of things. Does that make sense, Vipin? Does that help answer? Yeah, I mean, you know, there these wallets uh, that we are talking about they are called wallets, are uh, being used at scale. And uh, Dan is correct that, you know, a wallet is a portal, right? I mean, basically, uh, in some sense, it's a portal. In some sense, it controls uh, um, access to some credentials. Um, so there's, there's, you know, a mix of things in a wallet. I mean, wallet uh, in the beginning was just to probably to store gold or money, which actually had the actual thing in it. But uh, uh, when you use a card, for example, you're, it's more of, a, more of a portal into your credit. Uh, so it is, you know, you, you holding this credential, this physical credential that can let you into your credit. And of course, uh, the same applies when you're when you're moving value on a blockchain. It is some kind of a, 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 a way to a key to unlock things. Um, so you know when the wallet is uh, got all these different dimensions, it's very difficult to uh, talk about it, right? I mean, you, you, yeah, exactly. That is the stuff in a wallet. Um, Vipin, what's nice about that wallet? It's flexible, as you can see. Yeah. And the way you use that wallet could be different than the way I do, which yeah. is really cool. Yeah, sure. And, and, and Dan also, Dan, Dan also raised, you know, the wallet. If you look at the pure, the the open, actually the opening of the wallet report and the opening of the the chapter in the book is. Developers may say a wallet is really about the keys. The reality is that's not what an Apple wallet is. That is not what a Samsung and Android wallet is. That's what the market thinks. It's, it's just my digital stuff on my phone. Um, the developers may call, this is a very particular wallet. We actually delineate that in both report and the, uh, the, the chapter because I think we do ourselves a disservice when we're very, very focused on what I would call wallet storage. And there's a diagram in the thing 
that the terminology we use is pretty tough. But Dan, I'd love to follow up with you on that because reality is we don't have a definition and the market defines it for us. Well, I wasn't saying that it is one or the other. I was just saying that it's, yeah. it's got a multi-dimensional, uh, you know, um, let's say a footprint, right? I mean, it is, it's, it's many things to many people. Uh, I mean, if you think about uh, the fairy tales with the wallet, uh, you know, that's where you keep your uh, apples so that, yep. <laughs> so that you can feed the dragon on the way or whatever, you know. Yep. Hey, hey Vipin, uh, Mike actually asked a really neat question here. I just noticed that's uh, where do we see the state of wallets interact with multiple networks? Are most still aligned with a single network or good examples of merging to support more than one? And if so, is there a model for sharing credentials across networks? Um, I'll, I'll say in, in a couple of things, the, the interacting with multiple networks is a hard, absolute requirement if you want to have any kind of uh, uh, a generic wallet, a single use where you don't even know you have a wallet. I don't know if that really matters. Um, if you decide to support multiple networks, great, but I don't know if the user will ever notice and or care. As far as sharing credentials across networks, that's an interesting space that it comes down to, are you looking to move and re-anchor something or is it like i take it if we take you know casual discussions in with some people in, in 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 government you know you know where will they potentially long term not now uh support writing a digital passport to they may say in time hey yeah we will anchor down to the following seven networks and we're working on networks eight nine and ten anything beyond that go pound sand we don't support them I think we're gonna see a power law uh, uh, where there's a number of very large networks and a lot of smaller, more discrete ones. And you're gonna to have to support N networks and N must be greater than one. Okay. Uh, I mean, again, coming back to a physical wallet, it does support multiple networks. I can have a Visa card, I can have a MasterCard, I can have you know, various things. So there, there's bound to be, uh, sort of parallel drawn between a, a, a regular wallet and digital wallet. And we have to be ready to answer those questions. And Jim seems to have his hand up. So I'm going to. Oh, um, yeah. So the, I, I. Not Jim Mason, the... but Jim St. Clair. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Jim. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, wait, if it's Jim St. Clair, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He, he lowered his hand. So I, I oh. guess. Is, is, is <laughs> oh, yeah. I, uh, no, I just wanted to add real quick, uh, Daryl's comments as well. The discussion in general has been great on this issue of multiple credentials, multiple wallets. To put it in the good health pass perspective, our concern is that you get your vaccine in Cleveland, you get on your Southwest flight in Cleveland to fly to LAX, to get on your Singapore air flight, to fly to Singapore and go to your Marriott. You don't want to be managing 16 credentials and wallets while sorting it out and balancing your latte in between gates as you rush between flights. So you know, verifiable presentations, UX and those issues that, that are real things, as well as the real reason you have multiple wallets is, is part of the challenge we're looking at. Exactly. Yeah, but today you don't carry uh, 10 different passports. You only have one at the most two or three. I don't know. It depends on how many. So those passports are recognized uh, on all airlines, right? I mean, they don't, they don't say, oh, we don't support the US passport. And I think there are standards like uh, Dan probably knows more about this stuff than I do, but there are standards about international presentation uh, and uh, data item, uh, elements that yeah. need to be presented. Well, but to give you an idea, that particular digital one, I think took 15 years to actually come to realization. That's a yeah. very, it's a slow moving one, right? Yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, because whenever you have uh, multiple countries involved uh, in international. And, and, and multiple vendors whose lives are on paper. Let's yeah. not forget that. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead, Jim. I was going to ask uh, Daryl, um, two things that when I was looking at a solution for a state and said, okay, we're going to try to go digital on identity and credentials. And we used uh, in the Aries stack and so on, put out a prototype, everything worked. That was all great, no issues. 
But as I looked to the larger concept of saying, let's get this out in production, the two things that stuck out, you've hit many issues. What I really like is concepts today, which uh, as you said, vaults and delegation, all those kind of things that usually get lightweight uh, in consideration. But the two things that stuck out were number one, um, not everybody, not every adult over 18 in my state is gonna have a digital access period. So we're yep. still gonna have to issue an electronic ID card as a yep. substitute. But the reverse of it is, Oh, the other thing is, um, like it or not, Daryl, I'll see you in an airport and I'll steal your phone. And having done that, there, there goes your direct device access in the middle of an airport to your wallet. But the point is, if you still have a physical ID card, let's put it that way. Yep. If that ID card has, I'll call it a potential, um, I'll call it proxy uh, a link that you've consented as a way to sort of delegate access to your wallet that is in a vault, let's put it that way then the fact that I stole your phone is not really gonna be a big issue. And the use case yep. that I had was always working on at the state level was um, you need uh, call it insulin vaccine from CVS in the next five minutes. And the question is, given that I just stole your phone, how are you gonna get that access? I have to have yep. a backup way for you to get that access re reasonably quickly. So that was sort of my challenging use case. Yep. Uh, and then the second, the, uh, the other issue that was really tough for me which I don't know, and I'll call it the better minds on this call can probably answer it for me, is it, one of the things we're trying to do with ZKP and stuff is we talk about um, trying to avoid um, the idea that using the same addresses, we have data correlation. So the recommendation for many reasons is that you wanna do key rotation all the time. And what I'm not hearing anywhere is proposed solutions to what I, through key management services, if you will, to automate uh, key rotation. So making the key flip is one thing. Saying, wait a minute, can I get the history of my prescriptions across different keys? Um, yeah. How am I doing that? I don't really yep. see a lot of stuff showing up on that. Have you seen, Jim, and I do have to jump on another call momentarily, but have you seen Kerry? K-E-R-I? Yeah, no. we had a we had oh, a sorry, presentation. Sorry. We did have a carry proposal that did handle so, that. That's right. So 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 if, if you're like me, Jim, carry is an extremely advanced. Um, concept. There's a podcast with with, uh, with with Sam Sam Smith, who's the carry dude, and Tim Boma. Um, yeah. Called uh, definitively identity. Actually, he it had is, a, he had a presentation right here. Where where yes, he know, did. Yeah. Sam, Sam Sam or 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 Sam did. Sam Sam. Yeah. The reason I'm recommending the podcast with Tim is that I've seen Sam present. I've read some of Sam's material and I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really grok it until I listened to that mm -hmm. podcast. Okay. And thanks. I found it. I, I was just like, Oh my God, this is lightning in a bottle. Now yeah, it's early stage lightning in a bottle. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It was the forward key stuff that uh, really stood out. Yep. Uh, the, anyway, I think uh, we are at time and everybody's uh, jumping off. But thank you so much for showing up and talking about this stuff. Uh, we have a lot well, to discuss. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, obviously. We, we you know, one hour is nothing. Uh, Perfect. Well, well, thank you all very much. I do have to unfortunately uh, run right. away. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. So I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you for showing up. Uh, Stefan, um, Sid, various people. I'm going to turn off the, um, uh, you know, the Zoom call. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Vipin. Ste Stefan, we have to talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Call me anytime. All right, bye. Okay, perfect. Thanks, bye.